Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Powerless Podcast. In this episode, I talked to Andrew Herman, who is the vocalist for the band Johnny Booth, um, a hardcore metalcore band out of Long Island, New York. We talk about their latest record, Moments Elsewhere, that is really making waves in the in the heavy music community. Um, I've seen a lot more people talking about this band. I recently uh, kind of got into them from actually the editor of this podcast, Alec Hawkins. Um, so shout out to Alec. We, t- we, we mentioned that again in the conversation as well. Um, but this record absolutely blew me away when I heard it. Did a deep dive on the band, messaged them instantly was into doing the the podcast and we we talk a lot about the lyrical content of the record some of the political and social um things that really inspired andrew to to write on this record as well as some storytelling aspects uh, a book that he read that really influenced one of the songs and everything in between talk about his journey both through his uh, his political journey and the journey of the band and how it's kind of been an unconventional journey for the band the kind of diy approach they take to music why it might take them four years um, from 2019 to now to put out the next full length record um, and everything in between. They have a new, they have a tour coming up for the record starting on the 17th. Um, so make sure if you are into this uh, record, into this conversation uh, to check out where those dates are near you. I believe they're going on the East coast and heading out to the Midwest, heading to Texas. Uh, we He gives out all the different dates at the end of the podcast here. So just make sure to, to check that out. Andrew was absolutely fantastic to talk to. It was super great to kind of pick his brain on on where his lyrical inspirations come from, his his background with his family when it comes to politics, which was really cool. Um, and of course, the music itself and, and where the inspirations come from there. Uh, so I really hope you guys enjoy this conversation. I really appreciate that Andrew came on and did this with me. It was one of my favorite ones to do, and I just really hope you guys enjoy it as well. Before we get into the podcast, as always, you can find me on all social media at the Powerless Pod. Email me at the Powerless Pod at gmail.com. Whether you want to give me some information on how you feel about the show, what you liked, what you didn't like, or if you are a musician, activist, journalist, producer, whatever, um, and you want to be on the show after you hear this, make sure to email me there or message me on Instagram. Uh, I think Twitter's still a thing or whatever the hell it's called now. Um, and just make sure to reach out to me. I always love to hear from people. I've gotten a lot of good feedback recently. And so I just want to keep going with that and keep connecting with you guys. And I just really appreciate that you guys have been listening to these last several episodes. Um, before we get into the episode, I'm going to be plugging the band Whole Heart from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Metalcore band, very DIY, which I guess works on the conversation of talking about Johnny Booth here as well. Um Dreams That Die With You, the EP from 2022, is my number one EP from last year. This band is absolutely fantastic from the songwriting, vocals, production, which is all done in-house, which is really cool, um, and everything in between. Uh, so make sure to just check the band out. There'll be a clip playing right before we get into the episode, and then you'll hear our, my conversation with Andrew Herman from Johnny Booth. here for the powerless podcast with uh andrew herman from uh johnny booth uh how are you doing today i'm doing pretty good man how are you great uh i know i just asked that right before we started recording it's just <laughs> what i always do for some reason i don't know um it's, it's but, uh, yeah 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 um it's it's great to have you on i am super excited to have you on i have to give a quick shout out to the uh guy that edits some of these podcasts for me for the video format alec who's in another metalcore band very diy um that for months he was like you need to check this band out this band is fantastic and i'm one of those people that i'm like yeah i genuinely will and then it fries my brain and i kind of move on and then this record dropped moments elsewhere and i was like shit i haven't checked out this band yet and i've told alec i was going to listen to it and i listened to it and i was just absolutely blown away like no joke not just like talking you up because you're on my my podcast which again i really appreciate but might be album of the year for me we'll see if something else drops that's super crazy but i was really really blown away just at the production songwriting you know the um kind of 
curves you guys throw in production wise, everything in between. Um, so before we get going, I just got to say, you guys, uh, again, I w- w- went back and listened through your whole discography. It's all fantastic. Uh, but this record is a big step up. And I just got to say, like, this record's fucking fantastic, man. And that's all I've heard from anybody that's listened to it. So congrats on the new record. Um, Thank you. Before we get into kind of talk, I think we'll probably kind of start with talking about the new record, lyrical inspiration, how the songwriting process was, all that stuff. Um, what has the reception been for you guys for this newest record moments elsewhere that just came out a couple weeks ago in case anybody hasn't checked it out definitely do um, but uh, what's the reception been with this record compared to previous releases and and how, how do you feel the reception from fans has been going so far I mean so far it's been really great um, the reception has been awesome I mean all the the people who were already supporting us were all were you know, really really awesome about the new album and and like kind of the new additions that we've been adding to to the band and us trying to expand and and just be deliberately better than we were you know so Mm -hmm. that that was like the weirdest part i think about writing it It was there's a constant like inner uh thing just with within us as individuals but as a band just like you know this needs to be like a tier above where we were before um, and, and not really knowing how everyone was going to receive it, especially with, you know, a lot more of the clean stuff, like me, mm-hmm. me singing and a- Adam singing too. So, um, it's been really awesome. And I think just more pol- polarizing, um, I would say overwhelmingly positive, but I do like, it's actually kind of nice that everyone seems to have a very strong opinion and different songs that they like too, which is nice. Like when you talk to like, a few different people, they'll all pick like a different song that is their favorite, which is preferable. That that means that all, you know, hopefully all the songs are good, right? It sucks when you like, you put a record out and everyone consistently says, oh, those two songs are kind of duds. You're like, that sucks. Yeah. Yeah. This takes years of your life to do. Mm -hmm. Right. But it is kind of nice. Like there, there definitely is a little bit more hate than we've ever gotten (laughs) and i think before like who wants to punch down we were always kind of like the small underground thing that's just been around forever Uh but i think this one we've i think noticeably not just teared up musically but you know we've stepped it up career-wise i guess with the band that we've we've gotten a lot more supporters a lot more more eyes on us than we've had before and with that comes just people having strong opinions and i'd rather the I really fucking hate this album verse it's fine. You know what I mean? Like when yeah, people yeah. think your when your album is like middle of the road, um, that I can't think of a worse thing. I'd rather you yeah. really love it or really hate it. But you being like, it's eh makes me want to die. <laughs> I think, <laughs> yeah. So. Cause it's forgettable, right? Like that, that would yeah, be the whole like, thing is like, if you're like the, you know, I don't, I'm always bad at putting bands and genres because at some point it's become arbitrary over the years, especially. But, you know, you're in the metalcore, hardcore scene and there's nothing worse than like a genre, um, you know, full of aggressive bands, full of energy. You know, people it's not it's not necessarily, you know, like with some mainstream artists where people are are casual fans. Right. Like people are really into this genre by and large. There's nothing worse than being the middle of the road, like, you know, cookie cutter thing that. Maybe yeah. somebody likes a single or something, and then they just kind of forget about it a couple of weeks later, right? So that's that's kind yeah. of I love hearing that from you that you're like I actually love that some people hate it, and people yeah. love it, and it's fantastic. And um, no one hates a nobody, you know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. If it's something to hate, then that means we're gaining traction and we're hitting new people, you know. And I, I'm I, I guess I'm a good example of that because I'm somebody that heard this record, dove deep into it, and I'm an instant fan. And I know you guys are coming to Chicago soon. I, I really hope I can come check it out live um and we'll get into talk about the tour and stuff coming up here in just a bit but i listened to uh, a couple of interviews you've done um some some other people talking about the album a little bit i know you talked a little bit about lyrical inspiration and general terms and a few things that i've seen talked about you know that you're into especially in this record you were pulling yourself out of kind of complacency with the the lyrical inspirations uh talked about things like world and global politics storytelling from other people's perspectives um, if we could dive a little bit deep into, because I, I I I said this in the description of when I when I messaged you, but um, on this podcast I don't only talk to 
uh, musicians. I've talked to journalists. I've talked to political commentators. I've talked to people that are really into the weeds of like things that inspire their worldview and all that kind of stuff. So um, is there anything specifically that kind of when it, whether it comes to the storytelling aspect or the, you know, what you reference as some of the like world global national politics, um, I'm sure like social movements, whatever else. Uh, is there anything you can speci- specifically speak to when it comes to this newest record, Moments Elsewhere, that inspired you polit- or not inspired you lyrically with things going on in the world or things you read or anything of that nature? Sure. Yeah. I mean, that stuff is always kind of interwoven into everything that I've done. In fact, some aspects of this was me trying to like, like you, like you said, I was writing from other perspectives on purpose. They all fit within that mold, but I, that's kind of like interwoven into kind of who I am and how I look at things. I I definitely, I kind of enjoy hearing about politics and, and especially like world politics. Um, my grandfather was uh, a really, really big part of uh, um, the socialist uh, political party. And um, he dedicated his life really to socialism. And I think that's why my father is such a staunch conservative, if I'm being honest. Um, <laughs> well, I love the polarization there. That's fantastic. For sure. yeah. Well, to him, yeah. it's something we talked about recently, me and my dad, actually, because to him, he saw his father dedicate his whole life. And Sometimes I think with socialism comes like this really big group thinking, which is, you know, kind of nestled into it because you're trying to, it's not just about yourself, right? Mm -hmm. That's like at the core of some of it. And for my father, he saw his father dedicate his whole life to that. And then um, the way he was talked about, you know, as not an individual, it's almost like he was just another cog in the machine. It really, it really fucked with my dad honestly yeah i think that's a big reason why he actually ended up going the other way um but yeah it honestly a lot of that stuff is kind of woven into a lot of the the songs but i guess to pick one out in particular which is kind of like the the big picture of the whole album would probably be the ladder in 2040 those are like the big picture songs Mm -hmm. where the ladder actually what initially inspired me was a interview with uh, neil degrasse tyson Uh and he has this one it's like a viral clip he went talks about how like the universe was born and how we're basically made of everything was made of like the stuff within stars right so like right life is this incredibly precious thing We, we we don't know about a ton of other life forms obviously recently that's a whole other thing, but <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but you know, like as of right now, the the major societies that we know about is just on Earth, and we're made of shit that like stars are made of. Like the when you really think about how interesting it is that we are here and are able to have a perspective and and a mindset at all is this amazing thing. And then and then on the other side of it, like we created this world we have the power to create anything but we decided to create a world that really just benefits a very few amount of people and most of us are kind of living these mundane shitty lives that like in the grand scheme of things your time is the only currency that you have and Mm -hmm. the idea that the amount the amount of time that you you sell to corporations to companies to make money just to live like the idea of that really started to fuck with me and i think that's that was like the major inspiration behind the ladder and then 2040 was was really all about just like the prediction of the end of the world Mm -hmm. same kind of concept like this idea like when the end of the world comes like one day it will whether it's in my lifetime or not you know, I, I don't believe in religion at all, but I do believe that it will be man will somehow be involved in it, you know, yeah, um, through climate change or other other ways. And I think I'm going to be here in a fucking Zoom meeting um, <laughs> talking about, you know, some website for a pharma drug that I don't really care about because that's what I do. Um, yeah. And it's about that idea, like 2040 is, is some people, some predictions, right? There's always a million other predictions about the end of the world. 
Mm -hmm. But that's when they're saying like collapse of human society should right. be based off of climate change could happen. Right. And just that idea of that, right. That's potentially in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And oh, the yeah. worst part, I'll be old. So I can't even like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> can't even feel like you do, you can do anything about it or that yeah, you'll have the I'm energy like, to do anything about it. Right. Gonna come. The revolution's going to come one day and I'm going to be like 60. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's how I feel. You know, we're, we're relatively around the same age, a few years apart. Um, you bring up to I thought when I listened to 2040 was looking at the lyrics. Um, one thing I have to say, obviously, aside from the lyrical content real quick, is I love that you guys started off the record with just like two seconds and a second and just like a straight gut punch with that song. Yeah. It's absolutely fantastic. Yes, um, when play. I saw 2040 and I was reading the lyrics in the song and you do a good job of writing lyrics that you can tell a bit about what it's about and yet it's still enough that somebody could get something else out of it which i think is That's great correct. lyric writing um but when I saw 2040, I was like, I wonder if this is sort of like an apocalyptic like reference here. And that's that's clearly what it is. And you're right. That's, I'm into looking at things like that from the climate change perspective. And it's interesting. They'll say stuff like that. And then every year things happen quicker, actually, than they even for even like environmental, you know, people blowing the whistle. Um, scientists will will, will kind of set the bar a little lower than it actually gets to acceleration wise so you, you, you know in a, a few years you might change it to 2032 you never know but uh <laughs> but um but uh, uh thanks for going over that it's really interesting both to hear from the background um for you personally with both your grandfather and father from the political spectrum that's quite an eclectic uh uh thing to learn from um i think it's an interesting thing like just and i'm not here to talk about me but just you know from my perspective i am a person that is is for the most part, very left wing or socialist. And yet I have family that's all conservative, you know, evangelical Christian. And so you having that perspective, I think is interesting to just know where people come from and be able yeah. to, whether you're writing music or just talking with people to have that perspective and not just be like a polarizing, wagging your finger at things makes for great songwriting, great storytelling and just great conversation. Right. So that's a really cool thing to hear about with the latter specifically. Um, so thanks for going over that. Um, uh, were there any other songs in here specifically that either from the storytelling perspective um, or from the kind of, you know, what you were talking about with the political perspective that you can think of, whether it would be, you know, uh, just looking at the track listing here. Um, one of my favorites, I guess I could throw out there was Why Becomes How. I thought that was a cool one that was very different for you guys a little bit. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, that's an interesting one too because yeah. I actually got I, I have this book over here. It's uh, man's reason, uh, man's search for man's search for meaning, which yeah, is like yeah. a pretty famous book. But in the, so that's where the idea of that song comes from, and what so the name "Why Becomes How" comes from that book. The idea of any if you have a why to live, you can survive any how to live. Right, and it that that's basically kind of like the whole concept behind the book. Um, so yeah, that's definitely, it's weird how like that book's about the Holocaust and, and the psychological perspective of it. So I was reading that book a lot when we were writing those lyrics, you know, Adam definitely had more input on those lyrics too. When, when he's singing, we write, we write a lot together too. So that's really cool. There's, so there's songs that are definitely more, like me and then there's a lot a lot of songs are johnny booth like mostly ryan adam and me writing in a room together with a singular concept so right. a lot of times the concepts are mine and it's almost like a guided creative session like multiple creative sessions where it's like a, nick, it's like, nick was more it's, a, it's, it's like a it's like a writer's room for a television show right yeah, just like throwing cool. throwing things at the wall right yeah, so like there's a few like collapse in the key of fireworks, which is which is about my uh, my head injury. I, I started in 2020. I started having these fainting spells. Like I started just blacking out, and it happened wow. over the course of two years. It happened nine times. No warning. Middle of the day, I would just full blown blackout, unconscious. Um, it happened a few times, and the first time. I fell into the corner molding of a doorway and slashed my uh, skull up pretty good. 
Um, Ryan was there actually. So he got to see my skull and I had to go to the hospital and this idea of like time passing different for three months. And I immediately recorded storyteller actually, like, <laughs> like I had stitches in my face. I looked like shit when we recorded <laughs> storyteller EP. Um, but it, when we wrote that, I kind of like, I had the idea I wanted it, this song to be about this. I had a bunch of lyrics. A lot of times together we'll write the rhythms. Yeah. And then even even like Nick, I think at one point Scott was in the room too. Ryan and Adam are normally the ones who help me with the lyrics. And literally like a guided creative session, like, okay, here's the part where I want to kind of address this thing. And here's a set of lyrics. And then we'll all start like shouting things out like, oh, what if you said it like this? Or, or what if we changed the rhythm and we adjusted mm -hmm. these words here and there? So there really is like almost every part of it. Like uh, there's a lot of hands in it um, just got kind of throughout the process for sure. That's uh that's great that like, you know, I've, I've talked to, uh, this will probably be around the 20, 28th, 30th episode, something like that of this podcast. It's relatively new, but talked to a lot of different people and a lot of bands for better or for worse. It'll be kind of, you know, there's one guy that really spearheads the musical process Maybe that person also writes the lyrics as well. It could be like a one show podium with some, you know, like, uh, or, or, um, you know, one person writes the lyrics, one person writes the music and everything else just kind of comes together. So that's kind of a segue into another thing I was going to talk about with you, which it seems like it's kind of a mix of all these different ways of doing it. But what's the song? I guess we could talk specifically about this record. Um, what's the songwriting process typically for Johnny Booth? Like, is it, is it that, uh, one of the two guitar players, comes comes up with almost like the the threshold of a song is it more of an eclectic thing is there ever a time that people jam lives together in a room to write a song um what's the kind of process there for you guys when you're when you're writing these songs there's a few different ways but the, i'll say the primary way we write is typically um our guitarist adam mm -hmm. will have an idea and kind of write the bones of a song structure and ideas like he, we're really good at starting songs. Um, so he'll, <laughs> he'll write sometimes like half a song or three quarters of a song. And then we'll, you know, together refine and then finish that song kind of together. Like we basically we meet up twice a week, whether it's just sitting here literally in this room or Adam's apartment, or we'll go upstate where, um, um, Scott lives. He lives in mm -hmm. Albany. And uh, we'll kind of write like that most of the time. It's mostly on the computer, to be honest with you. Like, mm -hmm. And we've always been that way, oddly enough. like we When we started, we were like a garage band, not in a garage, like actual like garage band on your Mac. Um, yeah. That's how we started. Like That's how we started writing music. And that is like our comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So we start most songs with like MIDI drums and guitars a lot of times you know adam will come with the bones or you know uh, a lot of a lot of the uh song somewhat together um but there's always like a few like ryan tracks in there like sometimes ryan's the the one that kind of starts it but then we all get together and it kind of that's when it really becomes all of our song and we really get together and um we'll either sometimes jam the ending We'll learn the song and then we're like, how do we finish this? And then we'll actually just like write it live, which yeah. is, which that's a little bit more rare. It typically is like this really long over several weeks or months of a process of like writing a song or we'll write like different paths of the same song. So there's a few songs that there's like three different versions of that mm -hmm. aren't finished. And then at the end, we're like, this is the best version. And then we'll finish that one. Um, even for this record. So there's two unreleased songs from this record that I don't know if we'll ever release. We, we're constantly deleting. <laughs> constant. We've deleted an entire EP's worth of music before. Oh, like wow. studio booked, ready to go. Before we wrote firsthand accounts, mm -hmm. we had a studio session booked with five songs ready to record and then we uh 
the studio got flooded and then we just deleted them and wrote wow. their sand accounts instead. <laughs> wow. So yeah. That's, uh, a I mean, that's, uh, that's, I mean, kudos to you guys in a way of being like, you know, you've got these songs, you're ready to record them. You know, I think a lot of bands, um, I know that was a couple of years ago. That was 2019. You probably recorded it 2018 or so. Right. Yeah, um, but, uh, but you know, even then, you know, bands so much now, and this is something I really appreciate about your guys' band since I've kind of done some deep dives on it since I heard the newest record. Um, you know, a lot of bands now, for better or for worse, and I understand why, it's very much into like a content machine where, where like, you know, you feel like you're constantly needing to pump things out just for people to remember you in the age of streaming and social media and everything else where, where bands now are content creators half the time, it feels like, along with being a band. Um, yeah. Where like to be like, hey, this isn't uh, this isn't good enough. We're gonna we're gonna you know just delete you know pull it to yeah. the, pull it to the bin and start over. Um, yeah, scrap it for that- parts. We do that a lot too. We say scrap yeah. it for parts. So we'll like yeah yeah. There'll be like two. Some of these songs are an amalgamation of like several dead songs that we're like this song sucks, but these two riffs do not lie. They are good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So some there's a few songs like that. I think Ring Light Alter is a song like that um which kind of talks about that stuff too that that whole song's just about that you know like we're all just become fucking content creators and um it's all about your instagram and mm-hmm. what you are person like your personal brand like that idea yeah. i think drives me fucking crazy the idea like social media is dead it's all t te- it's television programming and it's yeah. you know how do how do you um how do you want to present yourself? You know, or I remember when I was a kid, like you said, we're, we're probably around the same age. Like you would just post whatever came into your head at any time <laughs> yeah. and all your friends would react and you'd start conversations with your friends. And it wasn't like, there wasn't like supposed to be this whole vibe behind everything with the band. It is that way, which yeah. I think that's why I don't post that much personally. <laughs> but, well, it's, um, it's, it's yeah. one of those things. It's one of those things too, where like, like you said, it's, you know, bringing up that it's like TV basically now. Um, especially when I, I think about like, I don't know if you were ever somebody that, you know, around, you know, like I said, rel- rel- relatively to our age of the age of like, you'd be awake late at night as a teenager watching like adult swim or something. And at 2 AM, I remember seeing like an ad for a day to remember on cartoon network or something like that. The difference is now, whether you're a big band or an up and coming band or a DIY band or whatever, it's like you're, you're supposed to essentially make like TV level advertisements for yourself to promote yourself. And then you're supposed to repost those at the right times, beat the algorithm, but like the yeah. amount of times I've listened to other music pod. And I'm again, not shitting on anybody that does this. You're trying to do what you can to, to make it in this crazy world and in, in music or in entertainment in any way. But like I've listened to music podcasts for half the time, the band and the, the, the host of the podcast or whatever are talking about how to beat algorithms. And, and you know, it ends up that they kind of have to focus on that just as much or feel like they have to focus on that just as much as the songwriting process. And it's like, yeah. when did you become like a, you know, it's like being like the, the social media manager for like a corporation at that point. It, it is like so that. weird, you know, you have to be like a little, a little company. And that's, and we really are like that, you know? Yeah. And I will say like all of the content, all the video work, all the design work that you see, all the merch, the social media posts, the ads, like that's all us. Right. It's all the band. Um, so yeah, I, I totally feel that because we talk about that all the time. Like, but I do think it has its place. And we talk yeah. about that a lot. Like there's a cycle. It's cyclical, like everything in life, right? So when you're, this is where we're at right now. We're at the top of the cycle, right? So like we just put an album out. Now's the time for all the content that we've been creating to come out and to come out properly. You you owe it to what you, the amount of years you've spent creating this music to present it correctly and and, and the way that you want to. And a lot of times, and for us too, a lot of us are designers. We like the, the visual elements to accompany it. And right. that's why we like to do it ourselves because they're going to match better when the band is making that stuff. But 
when you get to this part of the cycle and you've done the touring and now we're about to hit that bottom part, which is you writing again and recording, it's okay for you to like put that away because the right. base of the band is the music. Mm-hmm. If you're, you know, we were talking about before, like bands sometimes, and I, there's no, there's no right or wrong way to do this. So I'm not like knocking anyone, but I do think Absolutely. that if you don't have a little bit of a graveyard, of songs like you have to curate it a little bit you know Mm -hmm. i i think there's this pressure especially when you're um like really doing it you know when you're like in the industry and you're you're Mm -hmm. signed and you have a team around you that's eating off of you you know what i mean like they they make money when you make money they they need you to work you know it's Mm -hmm. a job now it's a little different um there's this pressure to like you put out an album out, you got to hit, you got to hit these types of tours, bam, bam, bam. You, here's like a checklist and then yeah. follow up in two years. You have to be writing during this. And I think sometimes it dilutes it where we're kind of, we, we, we're all a little older. Like we're kind of just doing this on our own. It's supposed to be for fun. Um, so I think having a place where it's okay to just be like, yeah, I know you want me to put out now out right now. And we want to, too. We want to follow up and um, we don't want to disappoint people. We want to be there for everyone. But the reason why, the, at least the way I like to think, the reason why people like our music is because we've really taken the time to vet it and care. Yeah. And if that takes me for another four fucking years to do it, then that's what I'll do. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like. I don't need to be a part of the conversation at all times. It's okay. Right. And that's, that's a, that's a, that's a, I think a great healthy way to view these things. Cause like, you know, I've got friends that are in some, some touring bands or people that are trying to, you know, get in that next level of touring nationally or whatever else. And like, you know, I, 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 I think they still genuinely enjoy making the music, but it's the question of like, in the, like, are you, are you doing this, like trying to get to that next level, doing the grind, so to speak, for you're burning yourself out because like you're trying to put something out that is not your best work or you're trying to like just get things done as quickly as possible to meet that 18 month or whatever span people at least used to do with albums. I don't know what the, I don't I think that's all been thrown out the window anymore at so many different levels. Um, but it's it's good to hear that that um, one that you guys do everything in house. That's actually really cool and as a more diy based band that's one like to be honest from a financial perspective fantastic right but also you don't have people kind of at your heels to get this or that done or you're not trying you don't have to do as much networking on the business aspect of stuff more than you already have to do with touring and merch and everything else so where yeah. you know you can really focus on things and still like you said it's still supposed to be fun like making music <laughs> is supposed to be enjoyable and yet like and i believe them that these people still love it but you'll talk you'll hear from kind of you know national international touring bands sometimes in interviews or just on social media about how they're all burnt out they're all like pissed off about various things whether it's you know labels taking this or merch cuts or whatever else and like it's valid but it just i could see where that would just burn somebody out and make it into a job which sure it's your income but like if you wanted if you were doing this for income you'd be doing something that's a little you know like like being in a band is not an easy way to make an income by any stretch of the imagination so it's hard it's really really hard yeah so it's 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 cool to hear that it's kind of like a good balance for you guys it seems like you really know what you're doing and to go back to the music aspect of things um you know i know that your last record obviously you had an an ep in between but your last record was 2019 this one comes out in 2023 like you said four year span between full-length records at the very least um but a good song and good music is still should be at least the the foundation of a band and is still the way you get despite all the social media nonsense and everything else, um, it's still the way that you get fans, right? Like I actually read while we're having this, con- I, I read an article this morning, somebody sent me from, it was something to do with like these major labels are really grasping at straws of like trying to find like pop stars anymore that get a big following and sell out the big, the big venues because they're relying on TikTok virality. And it's like, well, people are fickle on that. You know what I mean? Like somebody gets into one song from a pop artist, that doesn't mean 
they're going to get into their catalog. They're going to go see them live at some stadium and everything else. Like it still does boil down to good music. And when people find that in the realm of music that they're into, that's still paramount. I mean, I know social media and marketing and content yeah. creation, everything else is still helps and in some ways has gotten bands to some popularity they otherwise wouldn't have but if you don't have good music and you're putting out mediocre stuff or you're putting out stuff that has no soul to it like is it really going to have a career like even you know that you guys have had where you've been going strong for years and now it seems like this record is really catching a lot more eyes like that wouldn't happen if you were focused on all the other bullshit and not realizing what matters most is the music the production songwriting and everything else right yeah and we focus a lot on sustainable growth and uh, longevity. That's always been a focus of the band, especially since like maybe 2014, mm -hmm. when we really started to shift gears after the Bronze Age, I'd say, when we entered what we call the dark period, where it was like years of just kind of nothingness. Yeah. Um, we always focus and we, we check in with each other. Like we all have jobs and that's part of the reason why we're able to have that balance. So, so like, right. we need to maintain a certain life, you know, mm -hmm. just like within all of this stuff. I, I think that's the hard, that's the hardest part and the hardest thing to like do it. Cause we do, and we are pushing it for sure. Especially now, like we have more eyes on us. So now's, now's the time. But uh, if your music, if you're always focusing on like, these short cycles of like, we got to put music out within this time and we got to hit these tours and then we have to do this. Like how many of those bands do you hear about a year after they break up? You know what I mean? Like, right. especially for the, how long we've been around, like we've been in the game since like 2008, like mm -hmm. um, the, the landscape of bands that were up and coming, the next big thing, you know, going to change music not a single fucking one of them like are around now barely you know what i mean it's yeah. the, it's like the groundbreaking bands or the bands that like focus on a breadth of material you know like a like a glass jaw something like that where you're like mm -hmm. you're setting a foundation to hopefully leave something behind you know, that that's right. memorable, that affects people, that's a part of other people's story. Like, that's the cool thing about music is like, it reminds you of parts of your life when you're listening to it, and it can mean something to you. Like for a lifetime, like, there's, there's songs that are super important to me. And like, the person that wrote it doesn't even know I exist. You know, right. like, I want to be able to be a part of that for other people, because music has meant so much to me. Um, but if you're not focusing on longevity and, uh, you know, curating your music, then I think it's harder to do. It's yeah. not impossible, but I think it's a lot harder to leave an actual musical legacy behind. Yeah, I think I think there's there's a there's a lot of truth to what you just said there. And I think it's it's great that you kind of have that long term thing in mind that, you know, even if, say, 10, 15 years from now, whether you guys are doing this band or not, hopefully you are, right? But but that your music resonates with fans in a way that, like, they still go back to the newest record. They still go back to the previous record, everything in between. And, and that boils down to taking the music and the vision seriously, right? So, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think there's a big difference. And, again, for, for the third time, I think probably not hating on anybody that does it any differently. Like I have no problem with people that pump things out and try to keep the ball rolling, like in the here and now or whatever else, that's all fantastic. Everyone's in, on their own path, but it's, it's really cool to hear that you have that perspective when you're putting these records out. And again, not to talk it up too much, but I think that really shows in this record because the, the lyrical content, like we, we said earlier is very, you know, there's a lot of layers to it. Also, if somebody has no idea what it's about, it still makes sense, still could give them a different feeling to it. And the, the songwriting, just like some of the, I'm a, I'm a, I, for, just as an amateur, I'm a, I'm a guitarist and, and, uh, I, I do vocals in a, in a recording project as well, a heavy project. And, and just hearing some of the like transitions and the punches in and the little samples that will come in right before just some like guttural breakdown as well mm -hmm. just like on that aspect of heavy music it's absolutely fantastic so Thank um, you. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So before uh, I kind of talked to you a little bit, I know you've talked about the dark era or the dark period of the band. There's kind of in some ways been like two eras of the band with uh, a little bit of member changes. I, obviously, I believe it's been you and the, the, the two other guitarists the entire time and then switch out bass and, and drummer at different points. Um, before we get into that, just because I'm curious, because you seem like a, ver- a person that's, like you said, really into um, really into politics or really into storytelling and some of the books you reference and stuff. Have there been bands um, for you growing up or, or even now currently that um, have kind of spoken to you on that level, whether it's hardcore or, or other genres that um, influenced you in, in that way at all? For sure. I think growing up, I really struggled to figure out who I was. I, I a punk rock and eighties hardcore, like that stuff really gave me a sense of like, I guess, chosen family. And there's some, mm-hmm. some stuff baked into that, but you know, my, my parents are, uh, my father's family are, are Jews from Ukraine and my, my mom's family's from Ponce, Puerto Rico. So very, uh, you know, in Puerto Rican families, it's kind of like everyone, all shades, all in the same family. Like it, it's, we're a multi-ethnic mm-hmm. identity. And growing up on Long Island, uh, where the specific town that we grew up in, um, I I struggled. I really did um, yeah. understanding because you know um, racially I, I'm white, but I'm also Puerto Rican. I'm like in this weird gray thing. Yeah. Um, and I was just very aware of race and ethnicity at a very young age, and how important it is to some people and the way that they treat people, and it it just really fucking affected me. And I, I just wanted to outright reject a, a lot of that shit that, that I felt was a kind of like in my community. Mm-hmm. So I kind of, I struggled for a long time figuring out who I was and I felt like uh, punk rock and, and hardcore really spoke to me. And when I was, when I was a kid, I, I used to go to like shows at Tompkins square park Um in the city and I would go to a lot of like crust punk shows and a lot of like street punk stuff, like yeah. casualties, anti-flag, mm-hmm. um, you know, things like that. A global threat. I really liked a global threat a lot. The virus. Those were kind of the bands I grew up listening to that were like mm-hmm. current at the time. So that stuff definitely played a, like a huge role into kind of like how I got really into like leftist politics yeah. through those bands especially like street punk was you know pretty pretty into that stuff um and then like there were some rally there were there were some uh especially in in new york city the it started to blur a little bit like some of those uh like the cracktoberfest leftover crack um they would have like a festival at Tompkins square park and they would be the anarchists political parties socialist political parties would be there like passing out pamphlets and stuff. And, yeah. and in some cases, actually speaking in between some of the bands, I've been to a few like underground shows where they would have a political speaker come during the music. And then they would come out in between a band and like give a whole speech like about right. like leftist politics. Mm-hmm. And that's how I really got exposed to a lot of it. And it really, it really spoke to me. Really, yeah. really spoke to me. I, I was like really hooked on it. I think I actually went super, super left, super, super left, really, really on, not that, I don't know, the the idea of gauging everything on this weird, like left, right. Yeah. uh, Yeah. It's sometimes weird. Yeah. I like, I, I, sometimes I, I, everything relates back to graphic design because I'm a designer, but the the color spectrum, like when you ever see there's like the circle and it's like all the different spectrums of colors all kind of like grouped. I kind of look at politics a little bit more like that, but right. Or I think we all should. It's way more healthy. Yes. But what we call leftist politics, I, I really, really got into it because of that. And I think just me looking for an identity and that stuff kind of popping up at the right time. My father was always politically conscious. Like I told you a little bit history about my my grandfather. My grandma was very, very much a part of the socialist movement and um civil rights movement in the sixties. And, and I think, uh, that stuff, it all just kind of boiled, condensed down. Into kind yeah. Of right. You're, you're, stuff. you're sort of the, 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 the result of like a, of a recipe of all these different, different things, both from yeah. your family and from, from, uh, 
from kind of the punk rock underground scene, which it, it makes a lot of sense, especially at that time. I think there was a lot more of a cohesive movement in the underground, right? Like the socialist movement as an example or anarchist movements or anything like that have always been a little bit underground, especially in the United States, right? Like we haven't ever actually had something like that really go that mainstream ever in yep. this country for a variety of reasons that would take four hours to get into. But, yeah. um, but uh, you know, it, it's, it's interesting to hear about that. That was something big for you in the sense of like, you know, we're not even just talking lyrics from a band. You're talking about going to, you know, a fest or going to like a punk show and in between their speakers from these various, you know, political parties Um that would, you know, I don't. I, I would assume you were you were relatively young at that time. Uh, yep. That that uh, that would have a big impression, especially for somebody that's struggling with their identity. When somebody, regardless of you know anybody listening to this, regardless if you don't, if you're not socialist or anarchist or left or anything like that, just the sense of like solidarity of like a group of people that would probably come from all different walks of life that just like this sort of music and message. That would be a, a big thing just for your identity and probably for your you know, for your, um, for your, uh, what am I looking for? Kind of like your, 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 not your purpose, but your, your, uh, connection to something bigger than yourself. Yeah. Right? And that's what they're talking about a lot of times in those lyrics and at, in those types of political movements, um, they're talking about, you know, something bigger than yourself, but, but also the betterment of society, you know, like, you meet people who are like actively anti-fascist, people who are actively anti-racist. Like that really spoke to me. It really did. Yeah. Like meeting people who, who especially at that time, were were actively anti-racist. That the fact that I was aware that people like that exist um, and those ideologies really, it really spoke to me at that time too. So that's kind of like baked into who. I am how I look at the world and um, in all of my lyrics. And I do try to leave my lyrics, like you mentioned before, a little like open. Like this, I, I think these are ideal. I think these are a little bit more co coherent than like my early, early stuff, especially because we're writing together and like, yeah. you know, we're all critiquing each other constantly, which the, the pros and cons to that. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, I think there's like cohesive messages but I also, because I feel that way, I don't want to necessarily always push that on everyone. I, I, I really struggle with that. I, I actually always curious what other people think of this because I, I want to push those ideologies because that's how I feel and that's who I am. But I also don't want this music to only be for people who think like me. So it needs to be open in a way that people can draw their own meanings from them and they can have legs and you know, turn into something you didn't even intend, which I think is cool about music. Mm -hmm. but I think it's important to speak to people who aren't just me and to attract people into the band that aren't just like me. Everyone in the band also isn't like this, you know? Right. So I think it's important to kind of try to represent um, a, a wide range of, of ideas in your music, if you can, as long as you don't yeah. actively do it. There's, there's stuff in this, in this album where, I'm writing from a perspective of a person I do not agree with, you know? Which is super cool because I don't think a lot of people, one, like, would want to do that, and two, even if they do, could do a good job of it, right? Like, I think it's very difficult to, um, and it kind of goes back to, I think we, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, just, like, uh, maybe the connection you have with, say, you mentioned with your dad, who's more conservative, where you you want to be able to see things from other people's perspectives. I think that's that's something I personally have tried to work on a lot more in the past few years with everything in the United States being so crazy politically, whether it's mainstream or electoral or whatever. Just because, like, if you're not, like, what are you going to do? You're just going to, like, point fingers at people and, like, never understand where, where they come from? That's not humanity. You know what I mean? Like, the, and yeah. that's also not helpful for people. Like, what, if you do that to those people, why would they ever listen to a single fucking thing you have to say? Right? I agree. And it's, there, we're real. like, I think the news focuses a lot on the crazy, and there is more of that than ever. And I, it's baffling. And there's definitely a lot of that baked into this, like a lot of like anti QAnon type stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But 
the middle of that, like the core of those movements, especially of like people you might find uh, at a rally that you don't agree with. A lot of times when you really talk to them, like it's wage inequality that's fueling the, it's, it's the fact that there's a group of people that are outrageously rich and they make a ton of political decisions that, um, are not in your best interests, you know, Mm -hmm. that politicians are bought, that the system isn't working. Like if they were just slightly nudged in a different way, like there, there's that shoehorn theory. It really is a thing. Like there's people at these opposing rallies where you, if you really sat down and talked to them, the reasons why they're there are the same reasons why you feel the other way. You know, like they want, there is a little bit of an effort by, you know, people who have more power to keep us divided. you know, it's easier to sow racial animus and to, you know, make people feel classist about each other and Mm -hmm. blame this side for that thing. And it's like, it's, we're all basically the same people. If we really all group together and there was Mm -hmm. like a unified actual movement about, Hey, we need to address that. The fact that everything's getting more expensive. And yeah. we're, none of us are making any more money and it's compounding and it's going to become a huge problem when our generation is like 80 years old and we, none of us can retire. Like if we collectively as a society did something about that, there, it'd be no stopping it. But yeah, you know, we're but focused there's a lot on of, dumb shit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of apparatus involved that, make mm-hmm. sure that that never happens. Right. And that's, sure. I've read too many books on that. And again, I could talk about that for, for ages Same. here, yeah. but I, <laughs> I'm probably but I, like, I saw that you, you, your podcast talks about politics and I saw it come in. I was like, Oh yeah, I'm taking this. And I yeah, just like, well, I, I, I appreciate it. This, is, this it. has been a fantastic conversation. I had, yeah. I had a few notes of some kind of structured things I would, I would talk about, but honestly, this is better. I absolutely love it. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I mean, all the things you're talking about, you know, to, to, go back to the record a little bit you know it 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 goes into that in the semblance of you know you talk about going to like a a, an opposing rally say i mean i would just throw like say you go to a trump rally right right now or whatever else like there's some things people will say that will like blow your mind that they think but also when you boil it down to things that they actually care about on a day-to-day like not talking about who's running for president or whatever right like they are mad about the same things probably someone like you or I would be mad about. It's just like everyone's kind of pointed at what the problem is when the problem is actually all of it. Right. Um, yeah. And, and, uh, when it comes to, you know, I don't know, I always think of things as top bottom as opposed to left, right. Right. But I could, I could go into that for forever, but, but, um, it's, it's cool to hear about how all that stuff kind of inspired you in your music inspired you both from, from your, you know, from everything from, your background uh heritage wise to to punk rock and all these different things and kind of this understanding um when it came to starting the band first was this the first band you were ever in um and uh what uh what kind of got you guys together i know it was 2008 uh, you put out an ep that you've you said a few times you guys have sort of made sure nobody can find for various things but uh uh what what got the band sort of together how old were you guys when you did it and what was kind of what kind of got you going there from from the start yeah i mean in the beginning i mean me adam and ryan have known each other forever i've, I've known ryan our one of our guitars since we were three um we went to preschool together i all the way through college we lived together in college like adam i met in middle school i think ryan knew him in elementary school so like that core has always been there and like you said earlier that you can really break the band into kind of like two we can almost like break it into two completely different bands it's like the old testament and the new testament of the band right yeah yeah it really is you know um but yeah we just started making joke songs garage band songs and uh we all went to the same college we all went to oneonta and that's when it was like the first time because all three of us were did other things we weren't really into the same music and it was the first time that like all three of us could get together and write together and we met our original bassist and drummer in college and we just wanted to play keg parties and I started a house venue called the high ground in Oneonta. And that was like 
that was it. You know, we didn't really think about what this would be. I think the future stuff came during the, the I guess, the, the reset of the band during the dark period is kind yeah. of when the who we are now learned from all the mistakes that we made in the past of like all the things that we did wrong that I regret or didn't like. We had so much time to like um, reflect, yeah. which is not always easy for sure yeah. um it makes a lot of sense. like so so between um the newest record you know you guys kind of getting a little more eyes on on the band a bit um i know you've got the tour coming up that is the moments elsewhere tour it's your headlining tour um uh have you have you played shows previously to this tour with the new material um and what's the reception been like live with the new songs yeah, I mean, we ju- so we just played uh, two hometown release shows. So we have we have two hometowns. Um, it's it's Long Island. It's it's hard to claim all of Long Island. It's seven million yeah. people. But uh-huh. uh, Amityville Music Hall has been around in some form and some name since I was a child. Uh, I had my first beer in the parking lot. Got my first yeah. bite. Saw some <laughs> of my first shows. You know, like that was like the spot. It's a very accessible venue. But our first. Um, um, we had we had our first uh, release show at AMH, our second in Albany, which is kind of our, you know, when we were a band, we started Oneonta, very close to Albany. The first four years we were a band, we were more well known in the Albany area than our home where we're from on Long Island. Right. So we we really built up these two like separate <laughs> homes, um, and we try to play pay homage to both of them every time, and both shows went very very well great time uh i i love one of my favorite thing as a vocalist is when there's like multiple packs of rows of people up front singing screaming yeah. the words like that's what i want i really want i don't care as much about the throwing down as much as i want you to like embracing the weird and screaming at me <laughs> you know yeah, yeah like i absolutely. want you to know the words i want you to scream in my face when you try to grab the microphone that's the shit i really like that makes that lets me know that you're having a good time. Sometimes that shit's happening so far in the back. I'm like, are you guys happy? You know? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So the the song it's it's been it's been really amazing, honestly. Um, the last two sh- shows we played felt like something new's happening. Like there's something something different for the first time in a while. You know, it, it was like, oh, I think we're, I think we're doing this. And then yeah. these, 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 the shows on tour, like ticket sales are starting to look really good, especially again, for an independent band, not signed. We have a few, I would say a few key um, contributors from the outside of the band, like key partners. Yeah. But the core of the band is just the band. And the fact that we've um, been doing this and put this record out on our own has been kind of crazy. And yeah, the songs have been, has been very well received better than anything that we've ever put out. It it was humbling to be at my hometown in a place that I grew up going to shows and seeing everyone in the venue sing the songs back to me. Um, And, and just being with friends, you know, I think that's the that's some of the best parts for me. It's just like seeing all the other bands that are at the either the same level or that are growing. Long Island has a sick scene. I'm like going off on a whole tangent. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> Keep I going. Really <laughs> love, I really love Long Island and Albany. Uh, one, all, Albany is growing. Like they use, they they like are slowly starting to get a lot more bands. The health of a scene, I've I feel like is really how many smaller like fans like people you would see out in the crowd start bands on their own and slowly start to build followings of their own and then supporters of theirs you see in the crowd start to you know what i mean like it needs to be like this like i give you energy and you give someone else energy type thing it needs to be like this thing that's flowing through a bunch of us long island has a ton of bands that are like fucking killing it right now that are really pushing in this genre um, and a venue like AMH that's so accessible to any band to just be like, hey, I want to book a show. And I'm like, yeah, cool. You know? Yeah. Um, 
it's been really great. I, I'm, I'm just super excited and, and humbled and yeah. happy. I, that, it's great to hear because, you know, obviously from what I've seen and what I've seen is obviously just through, through online various uh, avenues of people talking about your band more, talking about this record more. Um, anyone that listens, like I was in, a, a, I was in the, the downbeat discord, which is, you know, Craig Reynolds podcast from straight from the path, very large podcast. And people were just like raving about the record. There's like so many people, in it. but it's good to hear that not only does it transfer from online, it also comes to these shows. And I know they're your hometown show. So that's might be where you have the biggest following, but like either way, like just to hear like the massive response and people scream their heads off to the songs and everything in between is, is absolutely fantastic. I love to hear that. Um, so I know this tour coming up, it starts, uh, for anybody listening, I had it pulled up, uh, August 17th, I think, right. Yep. Um, yeah. Next week. touring with, uh, with thought crimes and earth groans, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. uh, just make sure if you're, if you're, uh, from any of the areas just make sure to check out johnny booth live on on tour i i bet these songs absolutely rip live along with the the rest of your catalog um before i let you go and i'll have you kind of plug anything else that you that that we maybe missed here i have you know i i've said routinely on this podcast that people uh either love or hate doing this but it seems like most people like are are daunted by what i asked them here but i think it's kind of fun um so basically it's a hypothetical question i ask at the end of the podcast every time uh uh where say you are either not in johnny booth or all the members leave you got to get new members to do it you can pick any members of any bands living or dead to be in the band with you of any era of any bands who would you pick into basically being your uh your fantasy league uh rock band that is such a hard question, dude. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> no, it's it's a good question because you're just like, fuck, like how do I even yeah. build a lineup like that? I think, I mean, I just got to say it right off the bat, the drummer has got to be the drummer from the Dead Kennedys. Yeah, um, oh yeah. I think that there's like for a punk drummer of that time period, like they weren't, like that band actually had their shit together, you know, and he was an yeah. amazing drummer. Um, I think, I'd have to go drummer from Dead Kennedys. Dude, this is fucking hard. <laughs> drummer from... I, I, that's... Bassist. Let's go bassist. Well, you you know, you do the metalcore, hardcore genre, so I've said this to somebody before. No one's going to find this as a joke but me, but you can always pick a laptop, right? Some bands do that, so there, there, there you go. <laughs> no, man. Screw that. You know what's funny is I think if I was building my dream band, we probably wouldn't sound like Johnny Booth. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. I think Johnny Booth, Johnny Booth is Johnny Booth because we all have very strong backgrounds and different shit. And Which like, is great. there's only a few... There's only a few bands that really like bring us together, like Botch, Norma Jean, Boys in the Well. You know, those uh-huh. are the bands that really brought us together. That's why the Chariot, you know, things like that. Mm-hmm. But then there's all these outside influences, right? Like, um, like Mars Volta or you know other stuff. But I think You're if I was, my language if I was building like my dream band, it'd be like a punk band. I think. Yeah, yeah, which is like, fine. That, go for it, man. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what? Why not? Why don't we throw? Um, why don't we throw someone from like Mars Volta in there too? Actually, uh, no. The the guitarist from Foo Fighters, who is also the guitarist from the Germs. Um, yeah, yeah. Yes, that. <laughs> I'm gonna look. I'm gonna look. Hang on. I will get the. Yeah, I forgot right his here. name, but he he's crazy. That that dude booked his first show before he learned to play guitar, and now he's in the Foo Fighters. Like, what? Who is does that? Uh, Pat, is that yeah? Pat, Pat Smear is that the guy? No, is that right? Yeah, he's the guitarist from the Germs. Uh might be right. It is yeah, Pat Smear. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. There we go. So we got Pat Smear on guitar. We got drummer from Dead Kennedys. Drummer from Dead Kennedys. I'm also horrible with names, so that's this right. You could you could say from band, and I'll yeah, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll Google it here. You know, yeah, I can. <laughs> <laughs> Or I can Google it while I stall for time. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> you hear me like typing away. 
Um, <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> who's, that, who's the guitarist from? Um, yeah, we got to go like Omar uh, Rodriguez from uh, Mars Volta. Yeah, yeah. I think that like that like that lineup right there is like weird as fuck, and I'm and I'm here for I it. I love it though. I love it. He's also you, Puerto you, Rican, so I'm biased. It'd be uh, um, it'd be man if you throw in Mars Volta to like a a sort of like classic punk vibe from the from the other two, you you could get some crazy shit going on there. You know, yeah. And let's go basis from Nirvana. Classic. Yeah. yeah. Classic. Absolutely. Yeah. So we got we got Pat Smear. We got. Drummer from Dead Kennedys, bass player from Nirvana, and you said Omar Rodriguez from Marge Volta, right? Yeah. That is, that, hey, hey you, you, were, you were like, oh, man, I, I, this is another thing that happens. Everyone's like, I don't know how the fuck I'm going to answer it. And then everybody comes up with the answer in like three minutes, and it's fantastic, <laughs> you know? Um, so it is a great. really good question. I've, I've never – no one's ever asked me that. And I've been trying to – you know, because some, some podcasts do little like quirky, you know – things like that and, the, and, I, and i was trying to like there's a few episodes that if somebody listens back i try to do some of these other things and it just wasn't that great this is what i found is pretty fun because you kind of get people to pull out like in the moment who they really think of as like their their bread and butter like who they love in their respective instruments and music so it's just kind of it's kind of fun you know yeah. um and that yeah that would definitely be like a like a because I think like Mar, I always think of the Mars Volta as just being like this very experimental sort of like wild side of music that is somehow yeah. still so cohesive and so like I don't know, like like it, it can be like very marketable mainstream and then you just got people going balls to the wall with some some punk rock and a little bit of grunge. I absolutely love yeah, it. Yeah, but he also he was in at the driving. Yeah, too. and at the driving, fantastic, fantastic band. You know, so so, can, so it all works out. Both. The best of both worlds. Here. That's right. That's right. Um, well, Andrew, thanks so much for doing this. I had a blast talking to you about this. Um, I hope the the upcoming tour goes great. Again, for anybody listening, Moments Elsewhere out now. Um, absolutely fantastic. Metalcore, hardcore, heavy in general record. Um, and uh, before I let you go, just kind of plug where people can find you or the band on on social media or your your you know your tour dates, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then last thing is I always play a song at the end. So you can pick a song from the latest record or whatever else um, to, to kind of play at the end as we, as we send off here. Off the latest record, I think let's do, um, let's do Modern Dialogue. I think okay. I feel like that's actually pretty relevant here. Yeah. And I like, I like, the, uh, I like the tune. So, yeah, let's, let's roll with that. Um, yeah, you can find us. I mean, you can find our music uh, streaming anywhere that you find streaming music. Yeah. Um, anytime that you stream, it goes directly into supporting what we do. That is uh, honestly our primary source of income outside of merch is streaming. So I don't want anything from you guys. I just want you to listen to the music. And if you do, the money we make will go into touring more. We'll go into buying more merch. We'll go into buying better gear. So listen to our music and you are directly supporting us because we own all of it. So right. that's pretty it helps, cool. helps that it doesn't, you know, a huge percentage of it doesn't go to a label, <laughs> you know, right? So yeah. you actually it's get the streaming numbers. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, obviously if you like us enough to buy a shirt, sick, but the one thing people always message us and say, how can I support you? I'm like, just enjoy the music, stream the music, enjoy the music. It will, it does directly benefit the band. So, you know, Absolutely. do that. Tell your friends, word of mouth, the having those key supporters, like those epicenter supporters that really like to draw people in and tell um, about the band. Like you, that's how we got here. Years of the mounting that, you know, so um, that's really all I'm looking for. You know, follow us on social media, obviously Instagram, the, the TikTok. Um, yeah. YouTube is big for us. You know, we're really trying to push the YouTube channel. So, yeah, just, just follow us on social media. And then the Moment Tells What Tour. Um, if you haven't checked out the other bands too, Thought Crimes is really sick. I'm rocking their shirt right yeah. now. Um, yeah. Really, really awesome band. Earth Grown's also really awesome band. They both do their own very interesting stuff. So definitely check them out. Heavy as fuck. Um, and, yeah, Moment Tells What Tour. It's our first time hitting a lot of these places. It's It's kind of... You know, um, this is a trial run. If you guys come and you guys show that you want us to be there, 
we'll keep doing it. You know, if, if yeah. these shows do well, we'll book a whole bunch other, you know, like I said, we're all self-funded, self-run. So we just want to kind of see where we're at. Right. So like yeah. Syracuse is the first show starting on the 17th and then Pittsburgh preserving underground, which is going to be really, really awesome. That venue is super cool. If you've never been to a show preserving underground, I highly recommend sanctuary Detroit, which is super awesome. First time or uh, well, second time in Chicago, but our first time in a long time, Chicago, I fucking see you buying those tickets. That show looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. If you can make it to Chicago, I highly recommend it because I have a feeling that's going to be a highlight of the tour. Yeah. Um, on the 21st, we'll make a post about this, but we have something special going on that everyone will get to enjoy. Not a show, but just as much fun. Um, 22nd, we're going to be in Kansas City. We got Oklahoma City, four shows in Texas, Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, and Houston. Never spent that much time in Texas, especially um, in <laughs> August. So it's going to get yeah. a lot of fun and sweaty. Um, Birmingham, Alabama, Atlanta, which is long overdue. Atlanta is long overdue. Columbia, South Carolina, Virginia Beach, uh, Tenick, New Jersey. I hope I didn't just butcher that name. And then Montague, <laughs> uh, Massachusetts for RPM Fest. And that is the most animated you'll see me. <laughs> I absolutely love it, Andrew. Make sure to check out all those dates if you're in those areas. Stream the new record. And again, Andrew, thanks so much for doing this, man. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Oh, no, no, no. 